I am so, so, so excited to be back with my ICC family. I miss you guys. It's such an honor to be here. Thank you, Pastor Trevor. Um, but yes, very, very excited for this word. So Holy Spirit, thank you so much for everyone in this room. God, would you allow your word to sink deep within our hearts. Help us to leave this place with a deeper connection to you, Lord. Help us to grow. Help us to leave here just running after you with all that we have. Lord, have your way in this place. Thank you so much. In Jesus' name, amen. So when I was a child, we were on vacation in Puerto Rico. And first of all, let me back up. I'm half Puerto Rican. I know I don't look like it. I get slack. All the time from my friends not believing that I'm half Puerto Rican. I am indeed half Puerto Rican. In fact, I'm not even making this up. One of my best friends yesterday texted our group chat of some of my best friends from high school and said, I randomly just thought about the fact that Isaac's Puerto Rican and it cracked me up. So I get hate for it all the time for not being Puerto Rican enough, whatever that means. But we were on vacation in Puerto Rico and we were staying at this resort and we went to this mall in San Juan. And as we're leaving the mall, it was late at night, and my dad took a wrong turn, and we got a little turn around, and we're at San Juan at night, dark, pitch black, completely lost, no clue where we are. So they find a little gas station, and my mom gets out because she speaks Spanish, and she starts went in talking to this guy who runs a gas station, and he said, I'll give you the directions to get back to the resort, and then I want you to leave here, go straight to your car, lock the door. And then do not stop until you get to the resort. He said, if there's a stop sign, blow through it. Red light, don't care, run it. Do not stop. You are not safe here. It turns out that this little neighborhood that we were lost in was known for gang violence. And the whole time this is going on, my parents are in the front, freaking out, trying to get back to the resort. And I am in the back seat with not a care in the world, absolutely vibing with my little Game Boy playing Lego Star Wars. Not even a clue that we were in a hint of danger. I was so focused on this little box that emits light and has a fun game on it that I was completely unaware of the situation we were in. And I think a lot of people live like this. We live so, we can be so distracted by little things and little things that we focus on. And there might not even be bad things sometimes for us, you know. There's nothing inherently wrong with Lego Star Wars and a Game Boy. In fact, I think it's one of the best video games ever made, but that's just me. But there's nothing, yeah, you know, there's nothing wrong, there's nothing wrong with that, but sometimes for us we can get so caught up on these little things that we're unaware of the situation we're in. And this is kind of how Paul paints the Gentiles in Ephesians 4, 17 to 24. So if you have your Bibles, open up to Ephesians 4, 17 to 24. He's explaining the life of the Gentiles, and they're, they're so caught up that they're kind of like me. They, get, they don't even realize that they're in danger. So Paul says, Ephesians 4, 17, he says, Therefore I say this and testify in the Lord. You should no longer live as the Gentiles live, in the futility of their thoughts. They are darkened in their understanding, excluded from the life of God because of the ignorance that is in them and because of the hardness of their hearts. They became callous and gave themselves over to promiscuity for the practice of every kind of impurity with a desire for more and more. But that is not how you came to know Christ, assuming you heard about him and were taught by him. As the truth is in Jesus to take off your former way of life, the old self that is corrupted by deceitful desires, to be renewed in the spirit of your minds, to put on the new self, the one created according to God's likeness in righteousness and purity of truth. So I think the danger that Paul is writing to the Ephesians to warn them about is very similar to the danger that we have today. So Paul's writing to the church to tell them, hey, Don't live like the Gentiles do in their old ways. And I don't think Paul would have been writing to them to tell them, hey, don't do this if it's impossible for them to do this. And in Ephesus, everyone around them 
was living a life that is explained in verses 18 and 19. Everyone around them is living that sort of life. And, you know, for us today in our generation, there's a lot of people around us that are living this kind of life. And sometimes, even for us, have you ever felt that dissonance? Like, you want to do something, but then you end up doing the thing you not want to do. Or you, you have a desire for something better, but then you end up doing the thing that you wish you didn't do. Like, why did I do this? And this is, this is a possibility for us. So I want to share with you guys this morning how we can avoid falling back into the old way, to the old way of the world, and, and the, the ways of our old lives, by living the new life in Christ. So what is Paul explaining? What is the life like of the Gentiles? And we have to remember this, what Paul's explaining for the Gentiles, this is still the case for everyone who is not in Christ. He says they're darkened in their understanding, excluded from the life of God, because of, because of what? Because of their ignorance that is in them and the hardness of their hearts. And I think the key word for this it in verse 19. It says, they became callous. Callous. And because of that callousness, they gave themselves over to promiscuity, impurity, and a desire for more and more. It is, like, it, sin will never satisfy. It's that, that desire that you just can't get enough. Like, oh, I'm just going to take another step. I'm going to take another step. That's what sin does. So they are living this kind of life. And callous. So what it... I'm sure everyone has experienced some callus, some people running a callus in their foot, but I play guitar. And when you play guitar, a lot of people actually end up quitting because it hurts their fingers. And when your fingers push down against the, the strings, it's very uncomfortable, especially when it's your first time and it hurts. And then you get these little calluses, little bumps on your fingertips, and you can kind of tap them and they make a funny noise. But you get these little, these little calluses on your fingers, right? And it's, I know so many people who wanted to learn guitar and they start playing and stop because it hurt your fingers. So for the sake of this analogy, I want you to pretend that playing the guitar was something that dishonored God. That playing the guitar was something that was sinful, impure, and it wasn't honoring to God. So the first time I go to play it, my fingers are staying on that strings, I'm going to start to feel a little uncomfortable. I'm going to feel a little uncomfortable and kind of want to stop. And if I don't stop, it's going, to, it's going to start to hurt. My fingers are going to be very uncomfortable. It's going to be painful. Then if I push through that, if I'm like, yeah, but playing the guitar is so fun and it's so pretty and it sounds nice. So I just push through that and I keep playing. Eventually, I'm going to be able to play for longer. And then if I keep pushing through that, I'm going to be able to play for even longer. And then one day I'm going to get to a point where I'll be able to play that guitar all day and feel absolutely nothing. And if that's not a picture of what sin does to us, I don't know what is. See, the more that we ignore that conviction of the Holy Spirit, that uncomfort, and, oh, but this is fun, I just, uh, eventually it's going to get to a point where our hearts become callous and we feel numb. And I know I've been there a couple times in my life, even a couple semesters ago, where I felt the Holy Spirit coming to me, hey, you don't pray enough. And I was like, I will, I will. I'm like, okay, I'm going to pray more. And then classes happen, and then busyness happens, and then I get to the end of that semester, and I'm like, God, why don't, why don't, I, why don't I feel anything? And then I realize, oh, that's why. Because I didn't listen to your Holy Spirit. And if that's you tonight, maybe this morning, you're standing in this room, and we're led in worship. Thank you again, Pastor Trevor. That was awesome. And you're in communion and fellowship in the presence of God, and you feel absolutely nothing. And if that's you, I'm not here to condemn you. I'm actually here to give you hope. Because there's no callous, there's no hardness of heart that the Holy Spirit can't melt away. And eventually, you know, if, if I stop playing guitar for a while, and then I go back and I start playing guitar again, it's going to hurt my fingers. I know because I do this about three or four times a year. <laughs> I'll stop for long enough where I play, and then it hurts, and then I'm leading the whole worship set in pain. But there's no callus that can't be removed with the Holy Spirit. And actually, everyone 
that Paul is writing this letter to was at one point this kind of way. At one point they were ignorant and callous. So how did they become uncalloused? Well, Paul says in verse 20 that they came to know Christ. They heard about him and were taught by him. And they realized that the truth is in him. They realized that the only way of life, all truth, is in Jesus. That he really came and he really died and he really rose again. And they begin to walk in the way of Christ. And not just did they recognize that it's historically fact. They came to know him. And through knowing Christ, as Paul's going to go on in the next couple verses, there's a response. You know, just like my mom and dad got the directions out of that little neighborhood, they would have been so foolish if they heard that guy say, hey, it's really dangerous here, go this way, and they were like, yeah, but we love San Juan. We love gang violence. I think we'll just hang out here a little bit. We'll walk around. No one in their right mind would do that. Yet so many people, when they hear the truth of God's word, will say, yeah, but I like it over here. I'll go over there later. Like, I'll, I want to kind of hang out in here just, just a little bit more, and then one day I'll come back because I know it's true. They were actually affected by his example. But in order to continue to walk with Christ, we can't, we can't stay there. We can't stay in that place. So what is the response? The response comes in verse 22 to 24. To take off the former way of life, the old self that is corrupted by deceitful desires, to be renewed in the spirit of your minds, and to put on the new self, the one created according to God's likeness in righteousness and purity of truth. So Paul is saying, hey, that old life, that's not you anymore. You've, you've put off the old self, and you've put on the new. When we step into a covenant relationship with Christ, we've put on the new. The old is gone, and Paul explains this in other places. He explains it in Romans 6. And what these, the take off and put on, those, those verbs in the, are explaining something that has already happened in the past, yet has an ongoing effect. Right? So when we come into relationship with Christ, we are clothed in the new clothes of Christ, yet there's an ongoing effect of that. And the ongoing effect is our response. It's not just a, we put on, we do everything in our own strength, and it's not God does everything for us. It's, it's both. It's a both end. It's us partnering with the Holy Spirit to continue to grow in him and to continue to put on and be formed. Right? And why, why should we do this? Well, as we step into relationship with Christ, we have to remember that relationship requires responsibility. Relationship requires responsibility. But relationship also precedes responsibility. Like the relationship comes first. At this point in Ephesians, this is chapter 4, Paul spends the whole first three chapters not telling them to do a thing. He's just explaining to them their position in Christ, their identity in Christ. With the whole first three chapters is him explaining how We've been adopted into the family of God. How in him we have redemption through his blood. Forgiveness of our trespasses according to his grace. He says that in him we're sealed with the promised Holy Spirit. And that we were dead in our sins. But God who is rich in mercy made us his great love to us known. And he made us alive in Christ. And even though we were dead, we're saved by grace. And he spends this whole first three chapters explaining this is all that Christ has done for you. And it's not until chapter 4 where he starts to say, okay, in light of all that, in light of everything that he's done for you, this is now how we live in response to that. Right? and, And we know this. Like, we know with certain uniforms, people act a certain way. You would be blown away if you stepped foot into a Chick fil A and the Chick fil A worker looked at you, cursed you out, and told you to leave. You'd be like, what kind of Chick fil A is this? Like, where am I? We know that 
a, someone wearing a Chick-fil-A uniform represents more than just themselves. They're representing the company of Chick-fil-A, right? So if they are acting a certain way that you're like, what kind of Chick-fil-A did I walk into? We know that as we put on these new clothes, there's a, there's a way that we act now because of it, right? And for some people, you might be the only Christian that they know, and are you the type of person that they, when they see you, they think, what kind of Chick-fil-A is this? Or are you the kind of person that they see you and they say, wow, what do they have that I need? And think of, think of um, a wedding dress. Like you, you put it on once on the day of your wedding. You don't have to put the wedding dress on every single day to be still be married like you step into the covenant relationship you're clothed in the new clothes but now there's a way that you live in light of that covenant relationship and so there you've entered a covenant relationship to have the new clothing and now because of that our outward actions should match the inner position the spiritual position that we have in Christ our actions should be an outward expression of the inner transformation we've received through our union with Christ. Say that again. Our actions should be an outward expression of the inner transformation we have received through our union with Christ. And this doesn't mean perfection. This doesn't mean that you're never going to make a mistake, that you're never going to misstep, that you're never going to say something you shouldn't or think something you shouldn't or do something you shouldn't. It doesn't mean perfection. It just means submission. It doesn't mean perfection it means when I misstep I'm quick to repent and turn 180 and go and realign myself with God so there's one those two the put take off and put on are something that's already happened and has ongoing action and there's one verb in here that is a command a continuous command and that is verse 23 to be renewed in the spirit of your mind is a direct command to be renewed in the spirit of our mind right so with this new clothing in Christ we are being continually renewed into the divine image of Christ it's not a one and done type deal it's a process a long process of slowly slowly looking and becoming more and more like Christ as we grow in him And it's important to remember that it doesn't just say renew your minds. It says be renewed in your minds. So you have to remember that only, only God can truly renew your mind. We can't make ourselves renewed. We can partner with the Holy Spirit. And I love what um, Dallas Willard, how he describes, no, it wasn't Dallas Willard, Richard Foster in his book Celebration of Discipline ex- explains the spiritual disciplines as us partnering with the Holy Spirit and us basically putting ourselves in a position to say, God, come and, and renew us. It's not us making ourselves better. It's us putting ourselves in a position where we're receiving the work that the Holy Spirit wants to do in us. Now, only God can truly renew your mind. But when was the last time that you asked him to, if you're really honest? When was the last time that you went and said, Holy Spirit, like, teach me, renew my mind. What fills your mind? It's kind of funny that you were talking about this earlier with um, our thoughts and thinking. I, that's, that's so God. Um, but what, what fills our mind? Because our actions will flow out of our thinking. Like, what's inside of us, what's inside of us is going to come out. And Jesus made this very clear. He said, from the overflow of the heart, the mouth speaks. What are, what are you being filled with? What are you allowing to fill your mind? What thoughts are you allowing to fill your mind? What are you allowing to enter your mind? The, the fruit of our mind is revealed by how we act and live and behave. Like what's inside is going to come out. And when our mind is renewed, what will naturally flow out is good fruit. And again, it doesn't mean that we're always perfect, but it does mean that we're in a process of becoming more and more like Jesus. A process. It's important to remember that it's not just like a 
but what thoughts, you know, I had a friend who, he used to listen to a lot of music that was not great when we were younger, and we were younger, now he's a youth pastor, but he used to curse a lot, and, you know, I've heard so many people say this, and he was kind of in the same train of thought, like, well, if the beat go hard, the song go hard, but some of the music nowadays is just awful, and it's just filling, and so he told me, he said, I used to just curse all the time. And I cut out certain types of music in my life. I stopped taking certain things in, and I, like, it just kind of went away. And we have to remember, garbage in, garbage out. Like, what are we taking in? Are we taking in music that's not great? Are we take, watching shows or movies that's not great that's allowing this garbage to kind of stay in us and then eventually make its way out? Or are we filling it with are our minds good soil? Good fruit is only going to come from good soil. Right, so how do we place ourselves before God for him to bring renewal in us? So if you're taking notes, I want you to write this down. If you're not taking notes, I want you to write this down. How do we place ourselves before God for him to bring renewal in us? We surrender our minds to the spirit of God and to scripture. We surrender our minds to the spirit of God and to scripture. Because when our minds become rooted in the word of God, the spirit of God will bring forward fruit in our lives that bring light and life to those around us. As we, as we take in the word of God to our minds, it begins to clear out all the the clutter and garbage, and it's and it's it's literally life. I love if you've never read Psalm 119. I encourage you to read Psalm 119. It's the longest scripture in the Bible, and the whole thing is an acrostic poem, which basically means that every line starts with the first letter of the alphabet and it moves on. It's the longest, and the longest chapter in the Bible is centered on the excellence of the word of God and the perfection of the word of God. And it's this beautiful poem explaining the word of God. And it, there's a, a few verses in there that says, literally, you've given me life through your word. Like, as we take in the word of God, we're taking in life itself. Like, this book isn't just a book. It's living. It's active. It's alive. And as we take it in and truly treasure it in our heart, it'll begin to transform our way of thinking. It'll begin to, and then that, in turn, will transform the way that we live. And then we get to be those that get to share the, the good news to those who are, like Paul explained in verses 18 and 19, lost and in darkness. And we get to go into that darkness and bring light and, and share with them the truth of the gospel. Just like that guy in the gas station was able to tell my parents, hey, here's how you get to safety. Here's how you get back to where you need to be. We get to go into a world that's dark and share with them the gospel. Because who, I think I've said this before when I preached last time, but who's fruit for? Like if I go to an orange tree and I grab an orange, is the orange that the tree is producing for the tree itself? Or is it, no, it's for those around it, right? So yes, as I begin to bear fruit, it'll make an impact in my life, but it'll more so affect and impact those around me and will be life to those around me. So I think it's important that we, we take a moment and just ponder for a second. Is the fruit that you're producing bringing life to those around you or is it toxic and hurting those around you? And again, I'm not, be honest with yourself. I'm not here to, no, 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 just, no. like I'm here to encourage you that there is such life and peace and that there's, there's nothing, there's no heart too hard that the Holy Spirit can't bring life in. And if you are, if you do look at that and you feel like, oh man, I, mean, I think I am producing toxic fruit, that's okay. Repent, turn, like he's standing there with, not only with his arms wide open, but he's like, God is running after you. He wants you to be in relationship with him. So if, you're, if you feel like you're not, producing fruit, that's good, that's okay. You can. 
So this analogy, I'm going to tell you off the bat, it's a little, it's kind of weird, but it'll stick in your mind, and I'm going somewhere, I promise you. Who here has ever woke up late for work and realized, like, your alarm didn't go off, and you kind of wake up with that suspicious feeling of, like, I'm getting too much sleep. Something, something here's not right. And you wake up, your alarm didn't go off, and you're running out the door to work. Okay. Who has ever woke up being like, oh, man, I'm late. I don't have time to get dressed this morning. I'm just going go to go to work. And you show, just imagine for a second that you were late, and you chose, oh, I don't have time to put my clothes on, and you showed up to your job in your underwear. Think how you would probably feel. I, I would probably feel a little very weird. It'd be weird for everyone around. Vulnerable, probably. A little icky. Like, I, it would, everyone around would be like, what, is, what on earth is going on? And we would, just think, put yourself in that for a second. Like, how would you feel if you actually did that? It probably would be not, not a good feeling. But how many times do we wake up late, our alarm doesn't go off, and we throw our clothes on, we run out the door, and we didn't, not even for a second, acknowledge God, we didn't open our Bibles at all, we didn't even pray to start the day, and we just ran out the door because we're late. I've done that for class, if we wake up, oh man. And then I'm sitting in class and realize, oh, like I never. And I would imagine that our spirit probably feels pretty similar to how our physical body would feel when we don't take the time to prepare it for the day. And to actually, every day, clothe ourselves in the word of God and spend time with the Lord before we start our day. Because it's so important that we do that. Because we have to remember that it's, it's a war out there, spiritually. And how, how would our spirits feel if we're not taking the time to like, clothe it in the word every day and to, and to commune with the Holy Spirit so that we can go out and be effective for his kingdom in our day-to-day lives? And I know sometimes, and I've done this a lot too, you wake up and the first thing, you open your phone, you go on Instagram, you go on Facebook, you go blah, and... I know sometimes the reason that I do that is because I'm kind of hiding from something or I'm running from something, so I'm like, oh, this will make me feel better. And what if instead of, if you wake up and you're feeling anxious and you're feeling overwhelmed, instead of going to your phone, what would it look like for you to, okay, sit down, write out all those thoughts, and then surrender them to the Holy Spirit? All those thoughts making you anxious, all those thoughts that are, stressing you out as soon as you wake up, what would it look like for you to write them down, surrender to the Holy Spirit, and then look and say, okay, like, why am I, like, there's so many, there is something in this book for whatever you need in whatever moment. So if you wake up and you're, and you're stressed, what would it look like for you to, A, surrender them, and then realize, like, his word says to cast all your cares on him for he cares for you. And then you carry that with you throughout the day. And anytime you get an anxious thought, no, nope, cast all your cares on him because he cares for you. What would that look like? How much, how much better would we, f- A, feel during the day? And how much more effective would we be? How much more loving would we be to those around us if we took the time to do that? And not only, not only that, but being renewed in our minds through surrender of the Holy Spirit and through immersion in Scripture, it keeps our hearts soft. Like It keeps us from doing the thing that Paul, he says, hey, don't go back. How do we not go back? We keep our hearts soft before the Lord. Because whenever our heart gets hard, we tend to go more towards the things of the world to feel better rather than going to our Father to comfort us. And as, as we fill our minds with the, with the word and we stay in deep communion with the Holy Spirit, it'll keep us from becoming calloused. It'll keep us from, and I don't know about you, but like the thought of that is terrifying, that I could like know God and walk with him and then let myself become calloused. Um, I, wasn't, I wasn't planning on sharing this, but one of my professors was talking about Moses, and if you know this, um, 
Moses obviously like led everyone out from the wilderness and when he struck the rock and it seemed like a really crazy punishment for God to say, all right, now you're not going to the promised land. Like it seems a little crazy. But one of the things he walked through us with that story is that uh, he believes that Moses' heart actually became hard, and that's why he wasn't able to enter into the promised land. Not because he just, but the reason that he struck the rock and then says, like, I was the one that brought water is he got so, he was so hardened from the people always being crazy and not listening, and then his sister dying, and he became, his heart became hard, and that's the reason why God wouldn't let him into the promised land. So it's so important that we keep our hearts soft before the Lord. And I want to close with this. I read a book for one of my classes, and the author was explaining this story about his grandpa. Um, his grandpa was passing away. He was in hospice, and I think they had him in this certain room, and they were giving him this drug because he was in a lot of pain. And the nurses always warn the family members, hey, before you go in there, just know that this drug removes any sense of filter that they have. And sometimes family members will walk in there and be really hurt by the things that their loved ones say because there's no filter. So they realize, wow, is that really what you thought? And the author of the book said, okay, thank you for the warning. Like We want to go in. We want to see our grandpa. And they walk into the room, and they said the only thing that he was saying was he was just spewing out scripture after scripture after scripture and praises to God and loving words to his family members in the room. And I don't know about you, but I want that to be me. Like, if any filters removed, that the only thing that comes out is praise to God and God's word and loving words to those around me. Truthful, loving words to those around me. But you don't get there just by showing up to church once a week and maybe reading your Bible every two months, it comes as a, that is a result of a close friendship with God, of walking every day by the Spirit and being surrendered to the Spirit and filling our minds and treasuring them in our, in our hearts and in our minds. And anytime you read the word heart in the Old Testament, they didn't have a separate word for heart and mind. Like, it was one word. Because the way that they thought about the body was like the heart, and it's like the seat of all emotion. Like, your heart and your mind were, basically they thought of it as the same thing. So when you read in Psalm 119 where it says, like, I've hidden my word in your, your word in my heart and treasured your word in my heart, you could easily, that also means like, in my mind. Like, I've, hidden and treasured your word in my mind by like meditating on it and chewing on it and thinking about it. I had one of my friends this year in college, he had a clear phone case and so he put it, he would put in scriptures that he wanted to memorize and anytime he wasn't doing anything, if he was on a line or something, instead of opening up his phone and going like this, he would turn it around and he would read that scripture. And there's, what, what would it look like for you? What steps do you need to take to respond to walk in deeper and closer fellowship with God what does that look like in your life so I just want to take some time and pray um, if you have never heard of who this Jesus guy is and why he's important. The God of the universe sent his son down to pay a price that you could never pay to make a way for you to have a relationship with him for all of eternity. And if you've never responded to that message and would like to, um, could you just slip up a hand? We'd love to pray. Um, if not, that's cool too. Um, 
But yeah, I just, I would love to pray over you guys. Um, God, thank you so much for every single person sitting in this room. Jesus, you know the hearts of everyone in here. Lord, so if there's any hearts that are calloused, any hearts that are hard, Holy Spirit, I pray that you would touch them right now and that you would just melt all that away, Lord, that you would break off any calluses. Lord, if there's people in here who have been walking close with you, Lord, I pray that you would continue them, continue to guide them deeper and deeper in a relationship with you, bring them closer to you, guard them from callous. Lord, guard guard their hearts, guard their minds. And God, I just pray that we would respond to your word, Lord, that we would live in light of what you've done for us. So Holy Spirit, I pray that you would just reveal to us what is it in each of our lives that we need to change? What is it, what's a habit that we could start that would help us to walk closer with you? So I pray that you would just reveal that, that you would imprint that on the hearts and minds of everyone here, Lord, so that we can go out and we can take actionable steps to walk closer with you and not just hear a message and leave the same. Lord, we want to leave transformed. Lord, would you just open our hearts and let your word sink deep within us and let it guide the way that we live. Lord, so I pray that every single day, Lord, that we would be continually more and more shaped into the image of your son. God, that we would walk in a deep surrender to your Holy Spirit and that we would fill our minds with your word every day. Thank you for all that you've done. Thank you for all that you're doing in this room. Lord, help us to walk deeper and deeper in fellowship with you. In Jesus' name, amen.